So, welcome everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you today. Um, and uh, we have uh, the honor to uh, have today with us Raquel Urtason, who is the professor of University, of, of, uh, who is professor at the University of Toronto in the Computer Science Department, and she's the founder of Wabi. Uh, she came especially uh, from Canada today, actually yesterday evening, to share with you her research and give a talk on AI first approach to rev revolutionize self-driving at scale. She also comes back to her alma mater, EPFL, to receive the prestigious EPFL Alumni Award that will be given to her tomorrow at the Magistral. We recognize with this award the world-leading expert she has become in her field that will transform tomorrow's mobility. EPFL counts for over 40,000 alumni now. They are spread around the world and they constitute an incredible pool of talents who are EPFL's pride and their best ambassadors. EPFL alumni that I represent today thrives to offer its alumni a unique and international network, a lifelong bond to EPFL, and services to support them throughout their careers, while we try to engage them as much as we can also to support the development of EPFL and its future, future alumni. I would like now to ask Professor Fua to join me on stage to introduce our guest. Professor Pascal Fua received an engineering degree from Ecole Polytechnique in Paris in 1984 and his PhD degree in computer science from the University of Orsay in 1989. He then worked at SRI International and INRIA, Sophie Antipolis, as a computer scientist. He joined EPFL in 1996 where he is now a professor in the School of Computer and Communication Science and heads the Computer Vision Laboratory where Raquel did her PhD in 2006. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm honored to introduce Professor Raquel Rutasun, whom I've, I, I have known for more than 20 years now. Um, when, she fir when we first met, she was a master's student at EPFL. She was trying to decide whether she would do a PhD. And, uh, well, uh, fortunately she did. So she started a PhD and then she fell in love with Gaussian processes, which are a well-known mathematical technique. And to this day, Every time I use a Gaussian process, I think of Raquel. Uh, after that, she, so she graduated brilliantly in 2009. Um, and uh, from, no, before that? Okay, well, whatever. Uh, she graduated br brilliantly, went to Berkeley as a postdoc to uh, pursue her passion for GPs. From there, uh, she went to uh, Toyota Research Institute and to University of Toronto, first as assistant professor, and then, of course, all the promotion to associate in full. And there, in addition to uh, publishing lots of papers and uh, continuing to do her research, she discovered another passion, another of her uh, passions, which is self-driving. And I remember Raquel telling me at a conference that now she actually enjoyed all the many different problems that self-driving involves, and I'm sure she's going to tell us about this in her talk. Um, so actually, so not only did he publish a lot, but she also became uh, the chief scientist at Uber in, in charge of their uh, R&D and working, of course, on self-driving. And then, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, Uber decided to stop doing this. And Raquel, being Raquel, something that small would not stop her. Uh, so she left and started Wabi, her own company, to pursue her dream, which I imagine she's also going to, t to tell us about. So without further ado, Raquel, please.
Uh, thank you, Pascal, for the kind introduction. And um, I'm very, very excited to be here today. And I have so many great memories of uh, being at EPFL. Uh, uh, and it's amazing how actually 22 years uh, has passed since I, <laughs> I first started at EPFL. It's mind blowing how time passes and how well I'm getting, I guess. Um, and, you know, I was walking uh, to come here and I passed by uh, Satellite, which was, you know, one of the places I love to be, particularly in my first couple of years until I got really, really busy with my PhD and then there was less of that and more of work, I guess. Um, cool. So, so it's great uh, to to be here, and it's great to see uh, how EPFL is really transforming as well. Uh, there are so many new buildings, so many new faces, um, uh, so much uh, you know happening. I think here. So it's it's been a, a great visit so far, and I really look forward for the next two days uh, when I'm going to be here. Cool. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, you know what we are doing at Wabi, uh, which is I guess my new company. Um, and in particular, how we are bringing a new generation of technology that, uh, you know, finally is going to solve self-driving at scale, and in particularly uh, in the field of logistics. All right, so hopefully this works. Great. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we probably all agree that self-driving is really a very, very exciting problem to be working on. And it's technology that is really going to transform the world as we know it today. Right, we're going to have safer roads. We're going to provide transportation for people that today cannot move from point A to point B. We are going to uh, bring a solution to the supply chain crisis that, you know, with COVID is even worse. Right, it's so difficult to get, uh, you know, to get uh, deliver goods uh, to your house, to your laboratory, etc. Right. And what is very interesting is that, you know, the only solution to a lot of these problems is really automation. Uh, so this technology is definitely going to benefit society in so many ways. Um, so to tell you a little bit about the, the company, um, so we are basically, uh, you know, a new company uh, really bringing this next generation of AI technology uh, to solve cell driving for logistics at this scale. Um, so I founded the company a year and a half ago, and maybe a clarification of what Pascal said. I actually left uh, Uber before they wind down the, the, the project. Um, but, uh, you know, we are a base uh, headquarters in Toronto, a very proud Canadian company, um, as well as we have uh, offices uh, in San Francisco. Um, one of the things that is important when you want to become an entrepreneur uh, is, uh, you know, that you need to raise funds, right, to uh, bring your dream uh, to reality. Um, so, the, you know, um, this, is, this was really my first startup. Um, and on the first day uh, that I actually funded the startup, I basically stand in front of the investors and, you know, with a deck and a team. And I told them, you know, I want 100 million Canadian dollars, which is basically 83 uh, million uh, US you know, to bring this, uh, this dream for the next couple of years, right? No experience, etc. I was very, very bold, I was told later on. Uh, but, you know, um, I guess very successful on that first round. Uh, it took only two months to basically close the round, have all the money in the bank and ready to go. Um, and it was the largest Series A in Canadian history. Uh, and this, you know, reflects the excitement uh, out there in the investment com community about the kind of technology that we are bringing that is revolutionizing cell driving. Uh, we are laser focused on have to have the biggest trucks, right, class A trucks that, uh, you know, uh, bring uh, mostly drive on highways uh, and that really um, move goods uh, along, uh, along our big highways, right? And what we are doing is something that, you know, building a, pro a product that is ready to commercialize from day one. We are not here to build demos, as we've seen a lot of demos also driving. We are here to really bring, bring this product to the market. Um, and we have a full, uh, full stack solution. All right, cool. So, so oftentimes people ask me, uh, why trucking? Why not robot taxis? And you know, during, I guess, my tenure at Uber, I work in both programs, self-driving trucks and self-driving uh, cars. And it became very clear that you know, the area where really this technology is going to make a difference early on will be in trucking. And there's really two reasons for this. The first one is business side, and the second one is respect to the technology. On the business, this is one of the most exciting markets still out there to conquer. Uh, there is a trillion dollar market uh, right out there just yes, in North America, right? How many such markets do you know? Probably none, 
at this point, right? So there is definitely a lot of excitement in terms of you know the economics. At the same time, the logistics, uh, the transportation community understands that the only solution to this logistics crisis is automation. So they are all you know, getting ready for when this solution will be in order to uh, you know, utilize it. At the same time, from a technology perspective, uh, driving on highways is easier than driving on cities. Right? Um, in, if you think of you know, the complexity of the type of scenarios that you see on highways, it's more structured, right? Uh, so potentially it's easier to solve. It's obviously still a very difficult problem, right? The solution doesn't exist yet, right? Uh, but definitely is a solution that is simpler to develop than robotaxis, where even the problem of pick-up and drop-off is really, really hard, right? If you, I don't know if you guys have Uber or Lyft here or, you know, the equivalent in Switzerland, right? But when you look at how they do, uh, they drop and pick up passengers, you know, more than 90% of the time is typically an illegal maneuver. Right, and this is something that self-driving vehicles cannot do. So it's actually pretty hard to even, uh, you know, think about how to solve that one problem. All right, so there is a significant opportunity on logistics. Uh, right, cool. So where, where is the industry today and why do we need this new technology? Uh, so we've seen significant progress since the DARPA challenge that is now two, you know, almost two decades ago. Uh, but when it comes to commercialization, you know, this technology is nowhere to be seen, right? You don't go out the door and then you see self-driving everywhere, right? This is the, the dream that we are trying to bring, right? And you probably are thinking, you know, why is this the case? There has been, you know, great minds trying to solve this problem. There has been so many billions of dollars of investment, right? But still the solution is very far from where, where it should be. All right, so let's look a little bit into what is the reason that this solution doesn't exist, exist today. Um, so, in, in my opinion, the main reason why this is the case is the technology that is employed. When we look at, uh, you know, the mainstream utilized in the industry, uh, is you know, the software stack, for example, is very similar to what was utilized during the DARPA challenge, which is, you know, two decades ago. It's a very high engineered approach. It's an approach that is divide and conquer. Basically, you take this very complex problem of you have as input you know, data, you need to, from the sensors, you need to output what the vehicle should do, and then you decompose that problem into many sub-problems, and then you task engineers with a very tiny problem in this complex system, right? And with the hope that somehow you are gonna piece together all these pieces to make your final decision, right? So this technology doesn't scale, this technology uh, is built for incremental updates, uh, this technology is based on the fact that you know, you, everything has to work well uh, and you have this cascading of mistakes is something that, you know, is going to have a very hard time to really be at the level of solving, you know, all the situations that might arise in the world. Okay, so we need a different way to try to solve this problem, right? And the question is, okay, what is this different way? I guess something that will not surprise uh, Pascal is that for me what is important is actually to bring uh, AI to the picture in a central role. Maybe one more thing to say about the uh, current uh, approach is that, you know, it's very expensive, it's very slow to develop, and at the same time, one of the reasons that, or one of the main open questions is, you know, how do you test that this technology is ready for deployment? And, or what, how do you test so that you see where uh, potentially your system has an issue? And if you look at the industry today, most of this testing is actually by just driving, cranking miles in the real world. This means that you know, teams crank you know, several million of miles per year uh, in order to see what is the next problem that they need to solve. This is very expensive. It's definitely not the safest solution, right? And the, be the better that your system gets, the more that you need to drive, bigger fleets, more miles, etc. So this doesn't scale, right? So that's another reason why we really need a different solution to the problem. Okay, so we're going to try to bring AI to have you know, a central, you know. Um, role in terms of self-driving, right? Right now in the current approaches, you know, AI is utilized to solve some of the small independent problems, right, but not as a whole. All right, so, so probably you are all thinking, or at least those of you that are excited about AI, you're thinking that, oh, Raquel is talking about this magic neural net that takes data from the sensors or the radar, the cameras, etc., and comes out with the right solution, right? So I don't believe that this is gonna solve it either. And the reason why is that, you know, this is not interpretable. And 
you know, if the system does a mistake, you don't understand like why it is that it actually did this mistake. And for certain applications, this is not a problem. But for a safety critical system, this is definitely a problem because you cannot validate and verify properly the system. Right? This is something that regulators will have a hard time saying that yes, this system is something that you can deploy in the real world. At the same time, it's very hard to make progress because a black box approach, right? there is very little you can do, maybe change a little bit the architecture, but you have no insights in terms of how to improve this. And lastly, you're going to need too many examples to try to solve this, right? So machine learning works by example, right? Here is the input, here is the desired output. Um, and as a consequence, right, you're going to need to provide, for example, examples of safety critical cases, accidents or near accidents, which is unethical to collect in the first place, right? You cannot just go in the real world and say, I'm going to collect accidents so that my system can actually handle those, right? So that you can imagine how very quickly you get in trouble. All right, so, so what are we doing that is different than these two approaches? Um, so what we're going to do is create a new generation of technology, a new generation of AI algorithms that is going to help us to bridge the gap and then go to the next level. And in particular, we are going to have the characteristics of being end-to-end -end trainable, meaning that the entire system can directly learn from data. Right? So we get the automation that enables us to do uh, very, very fast progress to also be able to have uh, you know, to build much less, uh, much more with le less people. Uh, but at the same time, we're going to be interpretable so that we can trace back into why the system made the decisions it made, particularly if it decides something to be wrong, right? And this is going to be an approach that you can validate and verify, which, as I said before, is very important for the safety critical systems. All right, so it's going to be an AI first approach, it's going to be modular, it's going to be interpretable, but at the same time, end to end trainable. The fact that it's end-to-end -end trainable also enables us to be, uh, to be able to learn much more complex functions, be better at propagating uncertainty, and be much better at generalization in terms of you know, dealing with all the rare cases, the long tail distribution of events that might happen as you drive in the world. Okay? And for those of you that want to, you know, want maybe one more sentence a little bit more technical, so in particular, it's a new generation of algorithms that use deep learning, probabilistic inference, and complex optimization in order to make all this decision process. Okay? So it was very important uh, in order to uh, go to the next level in self driving uh, to actually have innovation from day one in the company. Okay? Um, the other thing that, or the second aspect that is very important uh, in our solution and the other key differentiator is our approach to testing, right? Instead of having a very large fleet and crank miles, right, all the time, which is, as I said, unsafe and very expensive, what we're going to do is uh, bring uh, simulation to the next level. And this will be the other key in order to solve self-driving. Okay? So I'm going to talk the rest of the talk today mostly about simulation. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of videos okay, so that uh, you are entertained. So uh, pick up your popcorn, and I hope you like it. All right, so, so this approach is going to be much more scalable, much more affordable. Uh, and as I said, we can build with much less. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how simulation works today in the industry so that you can understand why our simulator is so exciting. Um, so when you look at the industry, right, uh, people are using simulation, but simulation is just a tool uh, amongst many, many tools in order to try to test the system. And there is like three types of simulation that are exploited. The first type, they call it simulation, but uh, in reality it's not really much simulation per se, but what they do is that they replay logs that they capture by driving in the world. Right? So you replay footage that you already captured, and then you look at what your, whether your system will do something different than what they did before. Okay? So in this case, the robot is like my robot over here, right? Uh, so the self-driving vehicle is just watching movies and trying to kind of output what would have done if I was in this situation. Okay? So it's very, very passive. Uh, so the good thing is that you can test the entire system. The bad thing is that you don't understand the consequence of your actions because you're just passively watching something that was already good to start with, right? You capture some data, you didn't have an accident, right? You were driving, driving well, and then you see whether you do the same or not, right? So this is, doesn't give you that much information once your system is actually relatively good performance. That's what they actually use a second type of simulation, uh, which this simulation is oftentimes called virtual simulation. And the idea is that you uh, build scenarios of things that might happen in the world. Typically, these are simpler scenarios. 
And then you test only the motion planner, which is the box that basically decides what is the maneuver that I should do, given that I know everything about the environment. Okay? How the environment is today, what are the things, as well as how are they going to evolve in the future. Okay? So this is, you know, this is one step forward in the sense that now it's going to be reactive. It's like playing a video game, but I'm only going to test one part of the system, one small part of the system, motion planner. And the way that I test this is by giving perfect data. Right? So that's also not great. Right? I'm isolating into only a single component, and I have idealized inputs. Right? So that will not tell me also how the system might degrade and how everything might be correlated. Right? The mistakes that I make in perception, in prediction, in inferring the world will affect motion planners. So this kind of ignores that fact. All right. So again, that's not a great solution either. Uh, the third solution that uh, they employ, um, this is typically something that we see a little bit in papers. Uh, it's not really mainstream in terms of the industry. Uh, it's more exploratory. Uh, but it's the ability to use graphic engines to generate training data for perception. Okay? So you build these virtual worlds, and then you render them, and then you have the ground truth because you have created the world. You know where the things are. And you utilize this to train perception systems, to train and test perception. Okay? Uh, now, the, you know, this is a different type of step forward, right? But the problem is that uh, these systems are not realistic. These systems uh, are created by hand, these virtual worlds, so it's not scalable. Um, and there is a big domain gap, big difference between reality and real footage and what these simulators can do. Um, so you, you also cannot really improve your perception system that much. You cannot really test properly the perception system. There is a big domain gap. Uh, so that's also problematic. Okay? So there is a few kind of simulation tools out there that people use. And in the industry, typically, it's a combination of these things that every player might use, uh, but nothing that can really replace driving in the real world. Okay? So let's look at uh, what is the problem with this, right? Is that you have this pyramid where there is a bit of simulation, but there is much more of capturing real, you know, really driving in the real world. Because when you drive in the real world, you can really test your system, right? Everything is reactive, and then you can see the consequences of your actions, right? So with the simulator, I'm going to show you the next slide, right? We're going to invert this, and we're going to be able to do most of our testing on the simulator, and then we only need a little bit of road testing on the real world to do validation and verification. And this is a huge change in the industry where we can really flip around how everybody does things. Okay? All right, so let me tell you why this simulator is so exciting and what it's so special about. Um, so as I mentioned before, we need to create a simulator that really mimics reality. What does that mean? It means that we need to create virtual worlds that have all the diversity and scale of the real world. Right? We need to create simulations of the sensors that are super realistic so that the input to the system that we're going to test is the same as it will be in the real world. We also need to create scenarios of all the things that might happen, including all these rare cases, etc. And we need to do it in a way that is very, very realistic, that is immersive, reactive, so that we understand the consequences of our actions, right? And we do this all in real time and all automatic, right? That's the desiderata what you need. So how do you achieve this is uh, you know, a simple idea, but it's very powerful, which is that, well, if we go around and see the world, we can potentially clone it. right? And with AI, you can clone this automatically. And if you are able to do this super realistically, then you can create simulations of everything that you have ever seen. Every pedestrian, every vehicle, every, every part of the environment, right? every area, uh, say, in Switzerland, that you ever drove in your life. Okay, so we build uh, simulations by cloning the world, and then we're going to modify this world so that we can test many different things that never happened before. Okay? So it's a very, very simple but very, very powerful idea. Right? So you get the scale, you get the diversity, and through, since it's an AI system, through automation, you actually can do this all at the scale. Right? So that's you know, mind-blowing, very different from artists in their computer, generating some virtual worlds that are not you know, super perfect, and then trying to test in this you know, couple of scenarios over there. Okay? All right. And the, so that's you know, how you can totally transform the way that you do testing. But we can go one step further, which is we can use the simulator not just to, tra to test the system, but we can also use it as a training environment where the self-driving vehicle can learn to behave in safety-critical situations that otherwise would be impossible to collect in the real world. 
Okay? So that's the way that we can expose the vehicle to all the possible things that might happen, including you know, accidents, etc. And it learns to react and handle those well. Okay? So again, that's a big step forward in terms of self-driving. All right, so let me show you this. Uh, um, so I'm going to give you some insights of how the simulator works, and I'm going to show you some videos so that you can see. All right, so it's a, it's a closed-loop simulator. What this means is that we're going to simulate the world. Given this, we're going to generate the information about how the sensors in the vehicle will have seen that world, given where we are in that virtual world, right? Then we're going to take an action, right, that is based on our autonomy system, right, the system that is driving the vehicle. And that action is going to influence everybody else in the environment that is going to react to us. Right? And then we continue operating you know, like this, right? uh, creating a new virtual world right? that basically reflects what the actors do, create the sensors again, et cetera. Right? So now it's like you know, really playing a video game that is like reality. Okay? Cool. So it's immersive, it's, rea uh, it's reactive, and we're going to do all this in near real time on the cloud at a scale in parallel so that we have you know, many, many worlds uh, that we can test in parallel. All right, cool. So, so let's have a look at uh, you know some uh, some videos. Hopefully, this. Okay, cool. All right. So, so I'm gonna now demonstrate the simulator a few of the capabilities with uh, an illustrative example. Okay. Um, so that you see kind of what are the things that we can do, uh, and I'm gonna go one capability at a time. That obviously we combine to create these things, right? So that uh, you you see how um, you know what is the you know our ability to do to do things in the simulation. Okay, so I mentioned before that we can clone the world, right, automatically. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is how we can clone the world, and then I'm going to modify the world and then re-simulate it uh, so that you can see, uh, you know, how accurate the simulations are and the power of the simulator. And I'm going to show you this in terms of one particular type of sensor, which is cameras. Because humans, we are very good at you know, understanding cameras because it's like our eyes, right? If I show you LiDAR or radar, uh, it's going to be maybe a bit more difficult for you to see the realism of those sensors because you know, most of you haven't seen that ever in your life. Okay? So, so let's look at the, the, in particular, the camera simulations here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a little snippet of data that was captured by driving a vehicle, in this case, around San Francisco. And then I'm going to play and re-simulate this snippet. Okay? So on the left-hand side here is the original data captured by real cameras and later. And on the right-hand side, it's always going to be a simulation. Every pixel is simulated. Okay? So the first thing I'm showing you here is um, our ability to simulate the static part of the environment. So what I took is that I digitally clone automatically this log. Now it's part of the simulator. Every actor is part of the simulator. And then I remove all the actors so that you can see, yes, the uh, static environment. Okay? And then I re-simulate it so that you see the realism. Right? So it's very, very accurate. Right? It really looks like I was driving in San Francisco where there was no traffic, which is kind of a dream. Right? This never happens. All right, so, so let's go to the next thing that we're going to do with this. And now what I'm going to show you is I'm going to re-simulate everybody that was in the scene. And for one of the actors, I'm going to make this actor do something else that's different from what he did in reality. Okay? So again, on the left-hand side is the reality. On the right-hand side is simulation. And what I'm going to simulate now is that what will have, uh, you know, how will you have seen this if the white car was aborting the uh, taking a turn and was going back now to our lane? Okay. So again, every single pixel is simula simulated, and you see that the, the simulator is super realistic, right? Uh, you could have maybe believed that this was actually real footage. All right, so now we can change, right? This is showing the capability that you can take something that happened in reality and modify how the actors are driving around, OK? OK, next thing I'm going to show you is we can also incorporate additional traffic, right? Uh, in this case, I'm adding one more actor, right, to the scene, uh, which is the second car on the right, on the, on the right lane, right? This is an actor that wasn't there in the first place, right? So we can remove actors. That's the first thing I show you. We can incorporate new actors, and we can modify the trajectories of the actors. Right? This is a very, very powerful concept, right? because now with any actor that you ever capture can be part of simulations in this particular area. Right? And then you can modify what everybody is doing to create whatever scenarios you are interested in testing, including the safety-critical cases. 
All right, but we need to go, uh, you know, one step further, right? And um, some of the other things I'm going to show you, or what I'm showing you now, is now we're going to flip actors. We're going to flip who is doing what. Okay, so I'm going to take the white car and it's going to do what the gray car was doing, and the gray car is doing what the white car is doing. Okay, and again, I resimulate the entire scene. Right, and you see that, you know, again, it's very realistic, right? This could have been real footage. All right. Uh, let's go one step uh, forward or further, right? And I need one more capability for this to be really like the real world, which is I should be able to simulate the environment if I modify where I am with respect to that environment. Okay, this is what I'm showing you now, which is I'm going to switch where the camera is placed at the scene, the scene, and I'm going to resimulate the same scene, but now I'm driving on the right lane. Okay, is this clear now? So now we can actually, you know, not only change where the actors are, but we can also change our viewpoint with respect to the world. Okay, so that we can, because when we're going to drive in the simulator, right, depending if it's a different, you know, it's not going to be the same human driving, right, and the simulator, we're going to change the scenarios, etc. I'm going to react differently, and therefore, my trajectory is going to be different, so I need to re-simulate the world from different viewpoints, okay, which is my new viewpoint as I'm driving. So this is the set of things that you need in terms of to be able to do this next generation simulation. Okay, and hopefully this was very illustrative in terms of what are the types of capabilities that, uh, that you require, okay? And with everything you need to be like super, super realistic. All right, cool. Now let me tell you a little bit about scenarios, right? So, so now we can clone the world and we can modify it. That's great. Now we have to decide what are the scenarios that I use in order to test the system. Right, and again, these scenarios, what it means is that we're going to create situations, right, that are of interest, and the actors and everything within those situations are going to be reactive to us, and we're going to be reactive to them, right? And then every time I make an action, I will re-simulate the sensors, I will pass it to the software stack, and then it's going to drive in this virtual world. Um, so, so how can we create these uh, scenarios? Um, so we have um, a whole bunch of different um, uh, different ways to generate them depending on what we want to do. So in the industry, the generation of scenarios is either by hand with the system engineers that is typically very, very cumbersome, or they use very simplistic procedural modeling automation techniques to create simple scenarios, very scripted. Uh, in our case, uh, we have many different capabilities of ways to do this. Uh, we can create programmatic, so with a few lines of code, you have your scenarios. This is something that the safety team really likes to do because they want to test specific things, very, very particular, right? So they want full control of what they're actually testing in a way that they are also very efficient. Um, I showed you before that we can take something that happened in reality, import it in the, in the simulator automatically, and modify it. That's another way. Um, a third way that we can uh, do this is by using deep generative models, right? So now they are AI models. Uh, we can generate, you know, traffic situations that are realistic. Uh, we can also generate uh, different map configurations, um, different characteristics of the actors themselves when they drive, how aggressive they are, the composition, whether you are very Texas-like and you have a lot of, you know, uh, say, trucks, things like this, versus, uh, you know, in other areas you don't have so many, et cetera, right? So we have ways to create, uh, you know, an unbounded number of these scenarios. Uh, but this is actually not sufficient. You need something more. And what is this something more is that, well, now we can create exponentially many scenarios, right? Good news is that, you know, that reflect all the diversity of the world, right? And I can utilize those to test my system. So that's great, right? However, when the system is really, really good, it's actually pretty difficult to find a scenario where you're going to make a mistake, right? And if I just have a fixed set of scenarios, I'm going to need millions, billions of these scenarios to see where the mistake is. Now, it's much cheaper than driving billions of miles in the real world, much safer, but still, you know, I'm burning a lot of money from that nice Series A in terms of my cloud compute, right? I'm just basically giving everything to Amazon, Microsoft, or, you know, your favorite, right? So that's not a great solution either. So I need some extra automation in the way that uh, we are bringing, you know, the ability to understand our mistakes. Okay, and if this hopefully runs. Um, so we're going to do this through adversarial AI. So what do I mean by this? Or as an adversarial scenarios is that now we have the simulators in the AI system, the, 
the thing that is driving the self-driving vehicle, right, the brain, is another AI system, right, our autonomy system, and they are going to play adversary against each other, right? And by playing adversary, what the simulator is doing, right, is basically uh, building cases that with high probability, the, uh, the system will, will, not, not, will not be able to handle, right? It's like a teacher that is looking like, oh, you don't do very well parallel parking, let me find a parallel parking that is even more difficult so that you fail, right? So that's the game that they're playing, right? They're playing adversary against each other. And this can be actually done very, very simple in the, simply in the simulator, where the simulator is uh, you know, running in closed loop. We have the evaluator here that basically tells us how well we are doing. And then the simulator is, you, is doing this evaluator to modify the scenario, right, such that this, uh, when we look at the evaluator, it's going to have a, a bad objective, right? Basically, it's going to have a hard time dealing with that scenario, okay? And you can do this automatically, very, very efficiently, okay? Where now simulator is really playing, you know, nasty, right, and trying to create all those difficult scenarios. So this is, we use this, you know, uh, you know every day in, uh, this is the simulator that runs in production for us, right, where every time that you land, uh, you know, a piece of software in production, right, it goes through a battery of tests and all this adversarial stuff, okay? Cool. All right, and something that maybe is important to note as well is that you need to be a bit careful when you use simulation in the sense that you shouldn't overfit to your simulator. The simulator should have the diversity of all the things that might happen in the world, which means that you need to have diversity in terms of the behaviors of the different actors, okay? And these actors can be, uh, you know, simple actors, can be distracted actors, drunk-like actors, right? And then you need to be able to sample from those, utilize those so that you are not overfitting to only one type of actor. Okay, makes sense, right? You want to, no matter how the, you know, people are behaving in the world, because it's still gonna be humans driving for a very long time, you can handle those situations, okay? So you need to kind of marginalize across all these different actors. Cool, all right, so, and as I mentioned before, the last bit that we can do is train in the simulator, right? So for those of you that like reinforcement learning and other type of approaches like this, uh, basically every scenario that we show to the software stack, uh, since it receives information about how well it's doing, can utilize this information as loss function in order to learn to behave better, okay? And this is a, every tick of the simulator, right, in an instant, instant, instantaneous manner, okay? So this is very, very exciting uh, because now you have the next level of automation, okay? All right, and as I said, it's very simple, right? The evaluator just gives back feedback to Wabi driver. Wabi driver is the brain of the self-driving vehicle that basically is learning from the experience in the simulator, from what is doing well versus not. Okay, so now you can actually learn in the simulator. Uh, you can also learn in, you know, mixture of the simulator and the real world. So it's very, very exciting what you can do with uh, what we call Wabi world, which is our next generation simulation. All right, so, so the consequence of this is that I don't need to spend billions like our competitors in all these things, right? Um, if you look at you know, some of our competitors, their burn rate is more than a billion dollars a year, okay? A billion dollars a year, right, for the development, right? We can do this so much more efficiently and so much faster with this technology, okay? Cool, that's where, you know, uh, people are very, very excited, okay? So, so with what I, what I show you today, what can we do? Very cost-efficient development, right? We don't need these uh, large operations through automation. We can do much with less. Instead of, you know, I'm trying to replace the humans so that our humans, our team, only does the really exciting, you know, important stuff instead of, you know, spending their time just chasing the tail of what the software stack is doing. Um, so, yeah, and you get much faster development because everything, the entire system tunes automatically versus in the current typical approach, you will go one model at a time uh, in order to, to make changes. It's much safer, right? We don't need to uh, drive so much in the real world. And this is important because self-driving technology is not yet ready. So there is risk, quite a bit of risk associated with testing, right? And we wanna definitely reduce that risk. I wanna save lives, right, not having problems. Um, it's very, very highly scalable. Uh, the technology here, the simulator, the autonomy stack can generalize much better across different sensor configurations and placements, as well as across geographies, so that we can bring this technology and it's, you know, 
and bring it to market across you know, uh, many different uh, geographies. So the industry um, is typically very obsessed with North America and the Sunny Belt, and in particular Texas. Um, you know, I want to build this technology so that everybody across the world can really benefit from it. And finally, it's highly flexible uh, because thanks to the simulator, everything that we capture matters. You know, with the rest of the industry, every time you change a sensor or something, all your footage and everything has to be thrown, right? All those years of, oh, but look, I drive, I drove, you know, so many millions of miles. Yes, but you're not telling everybody that you don't use it. So, so that's not really a metric of how well you're doing. Um, here, because we can re-simulate reality, we can re-simulate any sensor, uh, we can reuse everything that we have ever seen. Okay? So we don't lose by building next generations, by using different LADARs, etc. And that's very, very important. All right, so I hope that you know, you're super excited about uh, self-driving, and in particular, you know, the, the role that it's going to play in logistics. And these beauties over here, uh, you know, are more than just a dream. They're going to be on the roads super, super soon, and I can't wait uh, to show you this. Thank you. to revisit. So first, uh, when we first met, we were both members of a graphics lab. Mm -hmm. So it seems that Raquel has returned to her roots. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, we had numerous discussions about physics-based modeling, which I think I was more arguing for, and Raquel was already arguing for machine learning. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the right, so 20 years on, What's the, what's the answer? Yeah, yeah, great question, Pascal. And as you know, I love graphics, and um, so I guess I'm bringing, bringing that back. Um, um, so the answer is neither AI nor physics-based simulation. It's a combination of both, and that's what we use for what I show you today. Physics, uh, uh, you know, you can model uh, with simple physics, uh, you know, reasonably well things, but it's not realistic enough so that you don't have this domain gap between reality and, and simulation. So you need something that bridges the gap in terms of the, the realism, and that's the AI piece. So our algorithms use are physic, physics inspired. They're not exactly physics, uh, uh, you know, they have some equations in there, but there is a lot of AI as well. Um, and it's in this combination that is like super, super, um, I would say, robust fast to simulate, and at the same time, you don't need to know a lot about the environment to create these really uh, realistic simulations. If you only use physics, you will need to know the material properties of every single element of the environment. Also, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, physical properties of the sun, etc., and that's extremely, extremely hard to know, right? And it will, you know, it will cost a lot of, you know, also money and time to actually do this. For us, thanks to this combination, you can do, uh, it's kind of the best of both worlds. You need to know, yes, a little bit of the environment that we can automatically extract and then, uh, you know, re-simulate very accurately. Okay. And one more thing. You said you were going to focus on trucks. Yes. But the talk you gave, so in what you described, what's, what is specific about trucks? Nothing is specific about trucks, ah, which is okay. the interesting thing, right? Which okay. is uh, everything here generalizes. Right? But it's very important that when uh, you are actually a startup, that you focus on one application domain. If you try to do too many, right, it's going to take you a very long time to get there, and maybe you will never get there. So it's important to bring a product to market to start getting revenue, etc. And we have these beauties, right, which is our uh, testing platforms, which are, you know, the biggest trucks, class 8 trucks. So that's our physical. Uh, you know, testing, okay. testing prototype, right? And that's what we, uh, uh, you know, what we're very, very focusing on. And, and this affects, you know, uh, really which scenarios we run for the software stack. This affects our sensor configuration. This affects how we build a safety case. Okay. Uh, but nothing on the technology is specific to trucks. Yes. Okay. 
Great talk. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, how would you react if I were to say that you're realizing an instance of the metaverse of things? So my thought is that the metaverse for humans has limited applicability, probably lots of money, but for objects like trucks, trucks that can learn from each other by being immersed in a virtual world, that could be an amazing opportunity. How you react to my view of the problem like this? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can call it the metaverse, you can call it whatever, right? I think this is you know, a funny name these days, uh, I call it simulation. Um, so, so it's important to know that here, you know, we are trying to do something that is gonna help us uh, test and learn, right? So we are not trying to solve, you know, what is in the mind of every actor that is on the on the simulator, right? Um, so, so it's focus in terms of you know what uh, what this metaverse needs to do. Uh, but you can, you know, if you want to view it that way, you can you can view it that way. Uh, but this simulation, this is not also specific to self driving. If you're in robotics. This will be like super, super useful for any type of robot that you have. Because again, nothing in the technology is you know, for driving per se. You can uh, exploit this for drones, you can exploit this for warehouses, uh, you know, surgical robotics and other things. You can employ you know, some of our algorithms. Um, so I think there is, there is a lot that we can do. And you know, we, right now, we haven't yet shown our trucks out there. That's what I can't show you yet. Uh, but uh, publicly, we haven't shown them, right? Um, but we have shown our simulator. Um, and it's, it's been amazing how it's been incredibly receiving the industry, but at large, in terms of robotics, into everybody wants a, you know, a license of the simulator. So that's great to see. So definitely uh, you know, a use case of the metaverse. That makes sense. Thanks for a great talk. So I have another graphics question. Um, so the idea is to clone the real world, put it in the simulation, and then you can retarget what you've acquired to different situations. So one of the advantages of the physically based rendering approach is that you can change the lighting, change mm -hmm. many aspects, and then everything works together. And so I'm wondering, in your current solution, how could you, for example, change the weather, change the lighting, or do you need different logs for different weather conditions and different lighting? Yeah, yeah, great question. So uh, we haven't shown this yet externally, sorry. <laughs> Apologies, I'm such a CEO now talking uh, versus a scientist. Uh, but uh, there is, you can manipulate things uh, such that you can change uh, illumination, you can change things like this. Uh, you can go to the level of changing shadows and stuff like that. So, so there are some of those great characteristics of physics space, but without needed to, as I said, know every single little property of everything. Yeah, yeah, great question. For example, we can simulate rain without needing to simulate every single raindrop. Right. Hi, Raquel. Hi. Great talk. Um, so. I agree that it can go actually very far in simulators. It can do very many things uh, more efficiently, even if it were, they were uh, feasible in the real world. So I wanted to hear your opinion about the things that you think we can't do in simulators or they're going to be very difficult. Do you think there are any questions that eventually we won't be able to answer with simulators or do you think we can go all the way to the end? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we are driving a physical track, right? So. So there are certain things like functional safety, et cetera, that uh, you can do with simulators, right? Um, and it's important that we still do uh, validation, right, and verification on the real world. The simulator is not gonna fully replace, but you can do so, so much more, right, if you have such a simulator, right? Things that you will never be able to observe in the real world. You can actually understand whether you can handle them. Um, so we are not trying to fully replace the real world, uh, but definitely get us much closer to what you will need otherwise, right? You will need the uh, millions of vehicles driving for many mm -hmm. years, right, otherwise. So do you have something like a specific in mind, maybe like a perception or control-oriented example where you think that creating that functionality in the simulator is gonna be too hard? I understand that in the end it's gonna be a hybrid. I mean, nobody's gonna believe or know it would be necessary to say that everything happens in a simulator, there is no need to the real world. But then other than like a testing bed and yeah, is do you do you have thoughts around that? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, um, there are things like um, 
let's see, uh, hardware in the loop simulation. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess there is a simulation attached, but we are still, you know, through hardware, right? Mm -hmm. So there are things like this that it's important that you still keep the hardware piece as well alive, not just everything virtual. And hardware in the loop simulation means that, you know, uh, when you are, you have a physical system, right, and you are driving this truck, the computer is in the truck, and, you know, the computer doesn't behave perfectly, right, in the sense that there is spikes and there is, you know, many things that can happen. So you need to be able to see how everything also behaves with respect to the behavior of that simulator, right? Mm. Oh, sorry, the behavior of that physical system. So there is hybrids like this that are important. Um, uh, it all depends into also how much you spend, for example, into um, uh, vehicle, uh, your vehicle dynamics and vehicle models versus uh, whether you need more control in the real world versus not. Um, I think I think there is no limit per se, right? But you need to really close the gap in all these different things. But I think the, the thing that is important is that in the industry there is this concept or this notion of, oh, I have a simulation for perception. Oh, I have a simulator for motion planning. I have a simulator for this one thing. You know, I, I kind of divide the world into just little pieces. And that's, that's not what you need, right? You need a simulator for the entire system so that you can actually do system integration and system uh, uh, verification and validation. And that's the big problem, which is, you know, how everything has to be realistic to, to achieve this. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, yes, you know, I'm going around, a little bit around myself, but I think you still should be able to create a, such a simulator. It's a question of how long it takes you to, to get there and then how much you do in the, in the physical world. But typically you do more on the control side that in the physical world than in the simulator. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Raquel. Thanks again for the great talk. Um, um, maybe following up Amir's uh, question, um, in your example you were showing uh, um, substituting vehicles, right? Um, um, are you also looking at humans? Uh, it, I feel that it's much harder to simulate humans or put humans that have body language and they have social cues that we don't know how to simulate. So how can you deal with humans? Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Um, so we have reconstructed humans and simulated humans, um, uh, you know, with um, doing like different activities and things right, that you can, you can put. Um, humans are uh, more difficult for two reasons, right? One is that they are articulated and deformable, right? So that makes, you know, one level of difficulty. And their intention, typically, the way that they behave is a little bit more random than when you're driving. You're quite intention when you're driving, although, you know, some drivers do uh, all sorts of crazy things, right? So there's definitely a different level of difficulty, uh, but definitely we simulate humans and they are you know, uh, is something that, that we need to do with their diversity and the craziness of what they, uh, they can do. Now, you don't need to simulate all human behavior in order to be, to simulate everything that you need for self-driving. So that's also important, right, to, to think about. Uh, not all, you know. In fact, in the context of truck, I definitely see that you have less human interaction, but if you have a robot in a crowded scene or uh, like a self-driving car in a, yeah. around Paris, it's much harder to. Yeah, yeah in, the, yeah, in the, I guess, kind of robots maybe that you do, it's, uh, yeah. it's a little bit, you need to be more human-centric, I guess, in the simulator, so that's why, uh, you know, I focus today a lot on the, on the vehicles per se, not on the humans, uh, but we still need to handle humans because, you know, even on the highways, right, you know, somebody's stop, uh, there's an emergency, uh, you know, they are going to be behaving, potentially interacting with us, we need to be able to handle those, uh, we still need to drive in surface roads and, in close to cities, right, or even in cities. So there is still, you know, some of the stuff that we need to do there as well. Uh, but it's, the, yeah, the complexity is smaller than, you know, this is one of the reasons I don't want to start with uh, cities, right, because, uh, yeah. yeah, people people do all sorts of crazy things there. Thanks. So um, thanks for your talk. I have one question regarding your, uh, the representation of your world. So basically you are creating the world such that you can modify it and create an infinite amount of scenarios. Mm -hmm. But how do you ensure that when you test your software that you're basically testing on scenarios which are representative of the real world? Yeah, yeah, great question, great question. Um, so Typically, in the, the way that in the industry people, people do this, or they think they're they doing this, is by creating these simple uh, behaviors and interactions. 
uh, that come from the interactions that you see in the real world. For example, uh, easy scene to somebody in front of you, somebody cutting you know, in front of you, etc. And you kind of vary those parameters, right? But that's still a very a small subset of the things that might happen. So for us, you can think of it as uh, the notion of coverage, right? What are all the things that I need to simulate so that for this specific operation domain where the truck is operating, I cover the space of scenarios that I might see, right? And there are, I guess, things that you can do that. Uh, ways that you can, sorry, there's ways that you can do that. And then basically you need to show that what we are simulating here covers the space of what I can see, right? And uh, you need to, uh, you know, capture that probability distribution and then be able to see that, or to show that why, when you're sampling the simulator, you cover all those uh, scenarios. That's coverage analysis, I guess. Yeah, good question. Hello. Hi. So in real world, you will have thousands of edge cases that occur very rarely, and some of, some of them you really need to have billions of miles of real footage to just understand that they exist. And so the question is, how do you imagine to simulate things that you don't know as a human? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is through, um, I guess, our AI systems can simulate the scenarios that you don't necessarily see. You, through adversarial, you can simulate things that might be difficult, which are, you know, corner cases, typically things that are very rare, but they still happen. There is also the fact that, you know, how do you extend what you see so that you can quickly understand whether you're something missing? And the industry today, um, you know, is thinking that, you know, I will drive my fleet and hopefully I will see the stuff, but that's never going to be big enough. But these days they have, you have dash cams in every single truck, in every single, you know, vehicle. So the information exists. It's a matter of can you actually automatically extract it and use it to create your simulation? So for me, that's the, that's the future. Great question as well. One more. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the talks. I think more a question to the, the COUR. So I remember reading an article in 2016, so where there was a lot of traditional automaker as well, uh -huh. probably your competitors, saying that in the next five years we will see more change in the car industry than in since the beginning. Now, six years later, I don't think we, we are there yet. So to your point of view, why were we too optimistic at that time? So is it like the technology is still not yet ready or is more legal framework which is missing or whatever? And then the second question is when? When will it come? You were mentioning it will be soon yeah. there. So when? The billion dollar question, right? Uh, <laughs> when is it happening? Uh, so to your point before, I guess uh, I'm going to be harder with the industry than you are. And typically we heard is one or two years away. Elon Musk is, you know, one year away every single year, right? Uh, and then it's never there. Um, so this is, I guess, the combination of two things. The hype of, I'm going to tell my investors, is there next year, right? Which you obviously know that is not the case, but you're not going to acknowledge it. And second is, some people were overconfident of their abilities to solve the problem, right? And these two things together are pretty bad, right? So the industry had lack accountability and transparency in terms of, really, you think that in a year you can put this? Obviously not, right? So this is something that I care a lot about, which is, you know, no more bogus statements, right? And when we say that something is ready, you know, we should really mean it, right? When we give timelines, it should really be real timelines. Um, now with the current technology, these traditional approaches, I don't think that's happening in many decades ever, or even ever, right? I think with this technology that, you know, I showed you today, you can go much faster towards that goal. Um, but I think the one thing that people need to understand is that, um, you know, cell driving is gonna be deployed first in a small operation domains that are simpler and then it's gonna grow from there. So it's not gonna be a switch that suddenly, you know, oops, it's solved and then it's, you know, forget about traditional cars or traditional trucks, you know, they are everywhere. It's not gonna happen that way, right? Um, and I think that's the other thing for people to understand, right? But the deployment into small operation domains is relatively soon. Right? There is still a lot that we need to do in terms of um, how to prove that you're safe. Right now there is safety frameworks, right? safety cases that the you know, industry has put out, but there's a lot of 
big words and no scientific way to actually prove it. This is something I really care about to bring a scientific methodology into proving the safety case, which is, I think, one of the missing components so that we can really showcase and, and give peace to regulators that indeed this is, uh, this is ready. Now, in terms of is regulation an issue, um, depends on which country. Uh, right now, uh, for example, the states right, is the most open, I would say. There is 30 something states where you're allowed to test self driving, so they are uh, you know, definitely open to help develop this technology. Um, so that's, you know, we are in a good uh, position in, from that perspective. Um, but we will see, you know, we continue to work with regulators to make sure that they understand the technology, they understand what are the um, missing pieces, and they understand the path. And, but it's not just about regulators, it's also everybody, right, has to kind of embrace this technology and understand what, uh, what it is and why it's a great thing to have it. Uh, so it's a very, very complex problem where you need so many areas, right? Uh, and everything has to come together. Uh, but definitely the fact that the, you know, the consequences are going to be amazing. Right? It's going to really transform in a positive way. It's bringing a lot of people to work together towards that goal. Right? Uh, but yeah, I hope, uh, I hope to show you these trucks very, very soon and uh, really deploy without driver.